Well, hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. This week, I have a special guest, Dr. Tim Muir. Dr. Tim is sitting down in Mapua in the beautiful uh, sort of Nelson area. How are you doing, Dr. Tim? Very well, thank you. It's Indeed, so, it's so uh, exciting. Strangely, a rainy day today, but that, that's probably the rest of New Zealand a bit rainy. Normally, it's always sunny here. It's a very <laughs> sunny place. So I was just saying I used to live down there for a few months when I was picking apples back in my young years and it was hard work but a very uh, beautiful area to live in so yeah you live in a piece of paradise. Um, Dr Ewer is um, an integrated medical um, professional and has a hyperbaric uh, clinic down down that way uh, and I wanted to get Dr Tim on to talk to I don't know if we have Dr Tim or Dr Ewer what would you prefer? <laughs> I'm going to go back with whatever people. works, for whatever people. works, um, <laughs> to share a little bit about uh, the work that you do and mm -hmm. um, talk about uh, traumatic brain in injury in particular is an area mm -hmm. that is obviously my interest with my mum's story. Um, so, can you give us a little bit of background, your background, um, and how mm -hmm. you got into to doing what you're doing in the integrative and hyperbaric side of things? Sure. Um, I guess my story from that point of view started off, um, I'm originally from England, so I trained in England at one of the English universities. And even when I finished my training and I'd, I'd come out with distinctions and all of those sorts of things, um, I thought there must be more to what medicine's about or what health is about, let's say, than what I had been told. And ever since then, I've been looking to find other ways to to improve people's well-being. So I continued on with my specialist training, became what's called a specialist physician. Um, but at the same time, I would sneak off at weekends and go to the London College of Acupuncture and learned acupuncture and I learned medical hypnosis and I ended up studying nutrition and uh, some homeopathy and a variety of different things, including bioenergetic medicine over the years course. Um, I spent a bit of time uh, working in hospital as a specialist um, and that's actually where I came across hyperbaric medicine. Uh, that was in Christchurch mm -hmm. where they had a big hospital. I was working in the hospital as a specialist and they have a big uh, hyperbaric chamber there. So I spent seven years helping to run that. We did it free and we spent our weekends and night time sometimes uh, helping people with the bends and carbon monoxide poisoning and all sorts of things like that. And at that point, I had a little bit of an existential crisis and decided I wanted to leave the hospital side and develop my own integrative clinic, which I did. So we're going back 20 or more years now. Wow. And I moved up to this beautiful area I'm now in and found a little place to work from and thought, well, if everything goes well, people will eventually just come to me and find me. And that's really what's happened. Uh, I started off. Um, way back then with just myself and a wonderful Maori receptionist. And now we have 23 staff uh, wow. in that part of the clinic. Uh, so much so that I've now moved across the road to uh, have a separate integrative clinic so that I can um, continue just doing what I like to do with a couple of nurses and myself and, and two other integrative doctors and uh, an integrative psychologist and these sort of people. Wow. Um, so it, it was a matter of pulling things together over time to, to have a variety of options for people, a variety of, in a way of languages, how to understand disease and wellness. And what I've found over all of those years is that there isn't necessarily, as, as the great sages have often said, there's many paths to the top of the mountain. So it's a matter of finding the right one for each person uh, versus a lot of Western medicine, which is very much um, scripted in terms of you have this uh, diagnosis, you have this treatment um, versus you are this person with this variety of different things going on in your life. How can we um, find ways of getting um, either balance or um, detox or whatever needs to happen in that process to get back towards health. So it's look, sort of looking more towards the root causes and, and um, as opposed to um, dealing just with symptoms and looking a little bit outside the box. Did you 
did you cop a lot of flack for that in the early days with, you know, coming from the sort of allopathic conventional medicine world um, and, and looking then at um, things like acupuncture and, uh, you know, things that are outside of the, the standard box, if you like. Has that been a difficult road or a, and how have you seen that change over the last few years? Uh, it's a good question. I think originally I had to do it secretly. Um, it wasn't uh, approved of, mm. and it was separate too. And mm. I had to, I had to have two different lives, a sort of Jekyll and Hyde component <laughs> going on. Yes. And um, and you can decide which is which out of mainstream or holistic medicine. <laughs> um, and um, uh, so that was kind of difficult. Um, but over the years, um, what I found is that if I started applying some of these techniques and people simply started getting better, uh, my colleagues would say, well, what are you doing? You know, what, what's happening to, to those people that don't normally get better and now they're getting better. And so that started me, it gave me the opportunity to start talking about some of the things I did. But to be honest, while working in the hospital environment, it was quite difficult. So yeah. it, it yeah. wasn't until I moved up and started my own separate clinic um, that it gave me much more um, uh, space, if you like, to practice other things. However, I will say that the, the conservative elements of the mainstream are still quite antagonistic to some of the things that we like to do in integrative medicine. And so there is that sense of walking along a very tight wire some of yeah. the times um, and having to basically practice really good medicine in a mainstream way plus all the other things it's so having so to be cover brilliant. both sides yeah being brilliant mm -hmm. in both sides of it so that you um, yeah and i i mean i i see as a someone who's come not from a medical background um but had a few issues along the way shall we say and going okay this isn't working i'm going to look outside the box for myself and um having you know a couple of with my mum, with myself, um, with my brothers, um, some very uh, great success in, in, in looking outside the box. Um, and I see a, a, a massive movement of, of change and change in mentality now because we have access via the internet and the, and the stuff that we have available via PubMed and all those sort of great places where you can go and do your own research, that it's no longer completely controllable what, um, what we do and, and we can take ownership more and we have the ability to take more ownership that we didn't have when we didn't have the internet and the ability to access great minds and great people and great research and the information that's coming out you know on a daily basis I mean no person on earth can stay up with it all it's just too much so if you're wanting to do your own deep dive into a certain area you can certainly find yourself down some very deep rabbit holes and becoming quite expert in a, in a, in a narrow field that you're trying to research in. Um, do you see that in the people that are coming to you, that there is a, a shift and that people are starting to come to you and say, hey, I've seen this, I've heard about this, I've read about this, is this something that's going to help me? Um, yeah. And people taking more ownership in that, in the, in the clientele that you, you sort of have? I think you're right. I mean, we're part of a informational revolution that's going on at the moment and it's it's escalating all the time it's growing and growing which is a wonderful thing most of the time except the for time. some which is either confused or fake news as they say yes um and i think uh, being well informed is the main thing a lot of this is about uh helping a person become informed about what's going on and so they can then take more control over themselves because they understand what it's about and so that's the journey in a sense. It, it's helping to understand the person to some extent walking in their shoes a wee bit to see, okay, what's going on? How can I put this together and express it back in a way where that person can make the right changes to bring about what they need to do? Um, that's in a very general way of yeah. looking at it. And yeah. uh, sometimes I, I, I had a great example this week of, a person who came in, um, a, a woman who was in her 40s, she was well-educated, uh, but she had a whole selection of what in Western medicine we might consider bizarre symptoms from neurological ones to 
skin to all sorts of things and um, she'd seen neurologists and various people and they'd all been scratching their heads about what's going on she's obviously not well we can't put it together um, but um, I said look why don't we why, why don't we try a different language for this and I then talked about the whole concept of um, low kidney energy and how it related to her tinnitus to her um, lack of mental uh, uh, agility to all sorts of components and it's not to say it, it was just a way of bringing a whole raft of things together in a way that had a sense to it rather than a sort of chaos that that chaos can be very unsettling yes. when you don't know how to make sense of it you don't and particularly if the experts can't make sense of it then you're kind of stuck with what the heck's going on Am I just going mad? Yeah. And, and she wasn't. She was just having a whole series of different things, which we could start bringing together under an umbrella of understanding. And even though we didn't have to use the TCM as part of the treatment necessarily, it gave it, it she felt so much more um, uh, at ease by the end of that with an explanation that seemed to bring things together. Yeah, and it enabled her to maybe take a, a new approach to the way, mm. it, say, if you're getting disparate sort of information, because it is really hard when you're looking at sometimes your your symptoms and then trying to go, well, where is this coming from and what is it? And, you know, and it could be a myriad of things um, and trying to piece it together. You must have uh, an incredible brain to be able to hold <laughs> all of these mm. facets uh, uh, without any sort of contradicting, um, you know, dogmas even um, within in the knowledge that you have. Do you find that a, a, a bit of a juggling act at times? It, I, strangely enough, not much. Um, there are various possibilities for that. One is if you're into astrology, I'm a Gemini. I'm not a great astrologist, mind you, but <laughs> um, you know, there's two of me or more. And uh, so we can talk to each other. Um, uh, I was brought up in a way where I, uh, interestingly, I, don't want to get into my personal background particularly, but at one point I was um, went to a very expensive English school, but I actually um, stayed with my mother in a council house in a really poor area. So I went from one group of friends in the morning to another one in the evening. Wow. And you had to talk the language of both. Yeah, yeah. You had, you had to, to be to a walk. chameleon to yeah. work it through. Um, and I, I think that uh, sense of um, dance of life um, is good because it, it makes one um, able to cope with lots of different things at the same time, try and bring them together. And being able to so relate to people. Training. It, was, it would mm. be a brilliant training um, and being able to be on every level and, and talk to people and communicate and, you know, um, having this wealth of knowledge from all of these different disciplines and science areas, it must be very, you know, like to have that broad spectrum um, that integrated approach, I, I think, you know, I, I wish there were more doctors available in New Zealand. There is, you know, we, we, we're starting to see more functional and integrated practitioners um, coming out. And then you've got, you know, your, your whole health coach coaching in different areas. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a changing world. And I'm, I'm hoping that there was going to be some change, ho hopefully, in the mainstream. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, I put a, a little plug in it, I may, about there's an organization called AMA, the yes. Australasian Integrative Medicine Association, which is a mix of both doctors who do integrative medicine and also other health practitioners. And so on their website, you can often get information about integrated doctors around New Zealand oh, and Australia. Fabulous. That's a really good tip. I'll put that in the in the show notes so and, and check um, them out. www.ama.net.au, but there's a New Zealand part of it. Okay, we'll, we'll check that out because you're yeah, getting an exhaustive list of people. Um, now, let's go a little bit into hyperbaric and, and I, I wanted mm -hmm. to sort of touch on today a lot, um, some of the, the possible treatments for brain injury. Um, mm -hmm whether that's, you know, from stroke or traumatic brain injury or, um, you know, concussions or aneurysms, in my case with mum. Your, your experience with hyperbaric in the, the medical uh, grave facilities, I've had a, a mild hyperbaric chamber 
Um, my mum, who my, my listeners sort of know my story with my mum, um, four years ago, we had this disaster after three months in hospital. We were told, you know, put her in a, in a hospital level care facility and she'll never do anything again. She's major brain damage. Um, I found Hyperbaric on the internet and I managed to get a, um, a commercial dive company that, that let me have access for a while. Um, and then I had such success there that I ended up buying a, a mild hyperbaric chamber and installing it in our, in our home um, and put her through, um, she's had over 250 sessions now at 1.5 atmospheres. Um, that combined, and that wasn't the, the only thing I did, and it ended up being an eight hour protocol every day that I sort of put together from pieces from functional neurology and nootropics and epigenetics and functional genomics and um, really diving deep for the last four years into the science and doing what I could, you know, it was either do everything I can or lose my mum. Those were the two options. So <laughs> um, I was desperate to get her back. Um, and on that journey, I've, I've um, you know, hyperbaric is so powerful has has so many um, things that it can be really good for. What what are your experiences with it um, and the work that you did in the hospital and what it's actually recognised for versus what it overseas perhaps is is being used for? Are two different things, aren't they? Absolutely. What's your take uh, on that? There, there's a sort of conventional set of indications for using hyperbaric, which the hospitals use. Uh, we only have two um, hospital hyperbarics in New Zealand, one in Christchurch and one in Devonport, um, which is really the Navy one, which the Auckland Hospital used. Um, uh, other than that, they're all private ones. Yep. So um, the hospital ones, uh, really, it's the history they came from. They came from a Navy-based history for treating the bends, really. Or in the ancient days, you go back 100 years, Kaysen workers, which are the people that put in pylons for bu building bridges on the water, right. you know, yeah. um, could they yep. go over yeah. the water, they had to put the pylons in and they would get the bends and the bends was because when they came up, they were in pain and they were bent over. Yep. So that's oh, that that's came, where the word that bends pain. comes from. Ah, okay. I didn't know yeah, that. Because they, they were having bubbles coming out into their spine and their muscles. Um, so yeah, the hospital based ones are really a very strict set of uh, criteria. Um, like, as I said, the bends, uh, various forms of severe infection, gangrene infections, um, a few other conditions like carbon monoxide poisoning, possibly cyanide poisoning, um, uh, but there are a limited number of conditions. It doesn't include brain injury. No. It doesn't include strokes. It doesn't include neurodegenerative diseases. It doesn't include fibromyalgia, a whole raft of things where we now realize there's reasonable evidence that it has some impact. One of the troubles with medicine, as you'll know, Lisa, is that um, it relies on this gold standard thing called a randomized controlled trial. And yes. that's where you have to do a very difficult um, process of having a placebo group and a treatment group. Um, and for doing that for hyperbaric is a nightmare because to try and have a treatment that isn't a treatment that looks like a treatment is quite hard. You, you can't um, fake it really. A lot of the, um, <laughs> the work that's been done is kind of mm, on the edge of how good it is. Mm -hmm. So most of the research we tend to see about is where we've used it lots of times and have said, aha, this seems to be working. It's anecdotal. Mm. It's case series. Yeah. And there well, are some great researchers, you all know, like Paul Harch in the States. Yes. Yeah. And so on. And to give them credit, uh, the Russians have been doing it for much longer. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of their stuff is unpublished. Um, yep. So there's a huge amount of volume of work going on around the world. Um, and now one of the best units is in Israel. And yes. Tel Aviv. So they, they've got some great work going on there. So, but these are the kind of, um, these are the people going outside the normal bubble of what's accepted as okay. Yeah. Um, and yet they're getting good results as far as we can tell. Until you get that RCT tick of gold standard, 
the conventional system is unlikely to change. That's the problem. And the, the, the having, you know, the randomized controlled trials is just not going to happen in something like hyperbaric that hasn't got a patentable drug. Realistically, yeah, the, I mean, the costs are too high, aren't they? And it's the cost too is difficult. high. And th there have been some trials, but um, they nearly always stop at 20 treatments. That's the, that's the number that they stop at. Really? Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that, that's, it's kind of like um, saying you've been on a drug for a month and let's see how it's worked. It's, it's kind of that way of thinking. You're not getting um, any of the epigenetic it, shifts happening in 20 so there's, treatments. Yeah, there's a whole lot of things that aren't going to happen in that time period. Yeah. Uh, or if they are, it's going to be fairly mild, Yeah. Uh, not, not as far as you could. And as you know, one of the things with Paul Harch's uh, research is he kept doing spec scans and checking up on patients, and he found that they were still improving at 80 treatments, still improving. I mean, hey, so if we stop at 20 with our RCTs, it's, it's not a great place no. to, to say, is this working or not? And, um, and you know... I mean, I know with, with mum, I've, yeah, like I said, put her through 250, you know, um, mm. and I still continue to see improvements and I do it in blocks now and then I give her a break from it. And it's in those breaks when you often get the, the next level of, of improvement. I agree. Um, and I, th I think that is the epigenetic effect shift. probably. Yeah. That you're seeing. Yeah. You know, it affects apparently um, 8,000 genes that can be. That's right influenced by these epigenetic shifts and it's, it's it's i liken it going to the gym you know i'm not going to go to the gym and in three weeks time come out looking like arnold schwarzenegger or you know mm. it doesn't happen that quickly but the the mm. angiogenesis the um the inflammation the stem cell production certainly at the higher um or lower pressures um mm. they happen over time do you see also a benefit in stacking it, for the want of a better word, with other um, uh, protocols? So, so other uh, things like uh, ozone therapy, for example, or PEMF uh, therapy, or anything else that you find beneficial yeah. combining? I think, I mean, I, I'd say yes in a, in a clinical sense of experience, but I couldn't say that there are trials. Yes. Because yeah. The trouble again that. with trials is they like to have only one or two variables. They don't want to throw a whole lot in at once. Um, great. I would start probably with nutrition, and there are a number of nutrients which you know about that you can throw into the equation. Um, I think as auxiliary treatments, um, my particular interest at the moment is uh, photobiomodulation. It's using laser treatment. I would be very um, interested to hear what you have to say about photobiomodulation. <laughs> So I think this, to me, is a, an up-and-coming thing. I've spent the last two or three summers going to a conference in Germany, a laser conference, where some of the, the experts get together from around the world and they talk about these things. Um, I've also been to one in Australia uh, last, last October. Um, what, what, we're now, what we've known about... Um, okay, let me tell... For, Lasers. We're not talking about cutting lasers, which are when no. you focus the beam to a point and you should drill holes and things like James Bond. You know, that's not one of those. Okay, no. <laughs> we're talking about parallel light, uh, photons. That is, they're going side by side, so they're not drilling holes in you. Um, and what happens with that? And there's a lot of great research. This is where there's far more research out there than most people know about because unless you're interested in this field you don't go looking for it mm. uh, i've got quite a big database now looking at all this stuff and um what we one of the things that it does it does a whole raft of things a bit like hyperbaric um but it particularly affects the mitochondria because your mitochondria are the little um components in every cell of your body pretty well yep that yep produces energy in terms of ATP and mm -hmm. NADH as well. Mm -hmm. um, and those mitochondria, well, if we, if we go back a little bit in time, those mitochondria are actually what's called protobacteria. In the ancient of days, they were bacteria that mm. had been incorporated into eukaryotic cells, our sort of cells, because they needed a bigger energy source. Mm -hmm. So these provided the energy. So we became the host. Evolution <laughs> took part, the place, if you see what I mean. So 
the interesting thing about mitochondria in, in their walls are what we call chromophores, which are uh, proteins that react to light because that's how the bacteria actually got their energy originally like plants they were converting oh, wow. sunlight into energy okay so our back uh, about the bacteria our mitochondria um respond to light of different frequencies so different frequencies do, do slightly different chemical reactions in the mitochondria um what uh, so that's one little fact to hold on to and w when that happens a number of things happen. One, you get obviously um, the ability to produce a whole lot of um, repair mechanisms get uh, mm -hmm. stimulated, energy mechanisms get stimulated. Um, you turn off excessive inflammation, a whole lot of things you want to happen, happen by getting your mitochondria to work properly. And in fact, one of the concerns that even about uh, getting older and aging is that our mitochondria are not functioning properly or we have less of it is the basis uh, of, of aging, really, isn't it? Mitochondrial it dysfunction. Is, it's certainly one of the big, big keys. Yeah. Um, so um, different frequencies will do different, uh, stimulate different components. Um, so we now know with lasers, we use different colored lasers to get different effects. Mm -hmm. um, however, the big problem is that um, if you try and, for instance, use blue or yellow, the penetration is very small. So, but as you go towards red, you get more and more penetration. And what uh, most of us now use is uh, infrared. Infrared yes. is the most penetrating of all uh, colors. And what you can now do is, is get lasers that will penetrate right through bone even, wow. through the skull into the brain very effectively. Um, and I can give you a story if you want a story, it depends on Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, no, go for it. What, what um, got me really interested in this area was another bit of serendipity um, where a number of years ago, um, a patient in Auckland, uh, well, it's um, a man in Auckland phoned me and said, look, my wife has got this terrible thoracic vertebrae, vertebral abscess. This is several vertebrae in fact. Mm -hmm. um, and unless she has continuous antibiotics, um, she gets very unwell and in a lot of pain. Wow. And so she'd been on antibiotics for 18 months. And every time That's she terrible. stopped, it, it flared up badly. To the point that they said, look, the only next thing we can do is do an operation where they go in through the, past the lungs, through the anterior approach, which is to scoop out the dead material and pus and try and rebuild the spine, which is a dangerous operation. <laughs> Horrific. Uh, yeah. And so the husband who was an entrepreneur, he had did some research. He's a very bright guy. And he, he came across hyperbaric oxygen. Mm -hmm. And so he found me mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, at the time, was the only person with a high pressure private. Yeah. Yeah. The hospitals refused to do anything. Yeah. So that's fine. So <laughs> they came down, we started treatment, and we were part way through the treatment. And he came in to me and he said, hey, hey, Tim, um, what do you know about lasers? And I said, well, not a lot, really. <laughs> and he said, well, look, have you seen these papers of how lasers at certain frequencies will kill bacteria, including Staphylococcus aureus, which she had? Wow. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Um, and I read up on some papers and I then researched more and I came back to him a day or so later and saying, hey, look, you're right. This looks quite promising. Um, he then said to me, OK, look, you find me the right laser and I'll get it here in three days from anywhere in the world. I thought, wow, that's a good. I hadn't been asked to do that before. <laughs> uh, so I found this one in the States, which was 25,000 US. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he had it there in three days. Boom. Wow. And we started treating with both. And um, the long and the short is after two sets of treatments, she has been able to stop all her antibiotics and has stayed well for the last 18 months, two years um, without wow. having any problem. That's amazing. And so basically, and the MRI has improved and everything's, you know, and there's new bone growth and so forth. So it just gave me that insight of, wow, there is so much information out there. Why yeah. don't I know about it? So I've yeah. got to know about yeah. it and I've been to these conferences. So now I'm starting to use uh, a similar laser to the one he got. Um, 
just by the way, anyone who wants to get one, I found yeah. that his was actually made in China and I got it for a third the price. Oh, what was it called? Because I'd love to, you know, have a look into that myself. Yeah, so it's it's a nice, it's it's a class four laser, so you don't want to play, it's, it's their lasers are class one to four, and uh -huh. four is the, the most powerful. Right, so you've so got to be very careful. Lasers, we're talking about. Yeah, so you've just got to be careful that don't shine it in people's eyes and things like that. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so I've been using this for a number of different situations. Um, there's some great research, uh, randomized controlled trials. Yes. Of uh, various things. One of them, which I found quite amazing, is using it for depression. Uh -huh. Where they showed that if you did the left frontal area, uh, that in a randomized controlled trial, they improved. Um, similar to drug treatment. Wow. So there we go. Is see. that something uh, looking at the vitamin D pathways or something like that? Or is no, it? I don't think so. No, I think it's a separate effect on, we know from in terms of depression, off the le often it's the left frontal area on a QEEG that's the main area uh -huh. or if you do a functional MRI. And so it's just that that was the area of this one to work on wow. um, to improve it functioning. So the thing with the laser is it's it's simply trying to restore normal cell function as best it can. Is that um, laser so, available? Like, can you, as a non-medical professional, um, get one of yeah. these? I mean, this gentleman obviously so did, this but is he might have had... getting far more, far more exciting because um, a lot of this work's been done with uh, the sort of laser that I would have, the class four, but they're now realizing that low-level laser treatment, it's yes. called LLLT, low-level laser treatment, which is class three, believe it or not, seems to work. And what, when I say that, believe it or not, is that this is something that's in the usually 50 to 500 milliwatt level uh -huh. versus I'm using 15 watts or 15,000 milliwatts. Wow. So um, what we initially thought is, um, hey, how can that possibly get through the skin, the underlying tissue, the skull, and into the brain at that level of power? It just didn't make sense. And yet the trials show that it does. And what we now realize is that the skull, when you look at it with very high powered electron microscope sections, actually has this lattice works of tubules going through it which the light can probably pass through. Wow. Um, because otherwise it just didn't make sense that something could hit this solid bone and still get through when, if you did it on, on something similar thickness um, without those channels, it wouldn't. Wow. So that, but anyway, so low level uh, lasers are looking very good at the moment and they're much cheaper and um, yeah. much easier to use i've got a so couple a variety um, of different ones on the yeah market. i've got i've, I've got um two from violite um the mm, 16 the violite, uh, neuro yes the, i've got the two neuro, ones that go which, up up the na nostril up the nasal yeah, um right. ones at the what is it the 8 855 or something in him that's the nanometer so nanometer. That, that's the actual wavelength which is infrared uh-huh um but then they piggyback onto that they what they call modulate it so that i think the one i've got the neuro one as well which is the 40 hertz one uh-huh i haven't got that one the 10 hertz one yeah that's um, the, the one that goes across the skull is it the one that uh of... it's, it's the actual so what this gets much more kind of exciting in a way from my point of view if you get if you're excited by te technical things yes i am um <laughs> uh is that the the wavelength of the infrared, which is the 800 to, to, uh, to 1,000 nanometers, roughly, yep. is infrared. Um, that wavelength is what is going through into, in this case, the brain. Um, what you can do is you can pulse that process, and that then becomes a frequency that's received by the tissue. So... It, to, to some extent, the wavelength going in is doing one set of things. And then on top of that, you can, um, what I call piggyback, but the correct name is modulate. Yep. The, the, so that you get a frequency which has different effects. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, a year or two ago, uh, uh, a patient who was a local barista 
uh, fell off his mountain bike um, and did the usual over the handlebars, hit his head, got concussed and tried to go back to work. But his problem with it, he had a cognitive deficit where he couldn't tolerate much noise, people or anything. Mm. As soon as there was a lot going on, his brain sort of short circuited. He couldn't think. Mm -hmm. And as a barista, that didn't work. Um, <laughs> he couldn't interact with people. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so he had to stop working. And this went on for months and he wasn't recovering. So he came to see me and uh, I said, look, OK, we'll use the laser. And we did a few sessions without obvious much improvement um, at what we call a continuous rate, where it's just the, just, the, yeah, the without basic a thing. infrared mm -hmm. process. But then I, I looked at some of the research and I thought, what I can do on my laser, I can actually put in any frequency I want. I can change it. It's, it's a sort of a fairly clever one. And um, I, so I put it at 10 hertz frequency. That session from then onwards, he just got better and better and better and went back to work. And he knew it the next day. He would said, look, I'm so much better just from that one session wow. once we did the 10 hertz. So what we're understanding now, and there's a lot of research going on around the world here. Um, there's a guy in the States called Michael Hamblin, who's a, one of the sort of gurus of this, but also in Australia and in Tasmania, interesting enough, they're doing a whole load of research. Um, looking at these frequencies, looking at what's best, looking at what, um, how much you need. And what they're finding, it's a little bit like hyperbaric. Uh, when I first started doing hyperbaric, we used very high pressures, well, partly because we're treating mm. divers, but a lot of the therapy was based on 2 to 2.4 atmospheres, yeah. the treatment of everything. Everything, yeah. As you know, what, what we're finding is actually some of the lower pressures are better mm. for certain situations, and particularly the trying to restore brain function. Yeah. And they're finding that with the lasers, you don't necessarily have to hammer in hard with a very high level. It's more about the subtleties of the right frequencies, the right dose, the right everything. So this is where a lot of work's going on. I don't think we've got all the answers by a long way, yeah. I think but I think it's a very exciting field. And quite uh, a low what's... risk, uh, quite a low risk, you know. Very, uh... very low risk. What we do know about, as you're saying, is the laser, this sort of laser is pretty well without risk, providing you don't look at it. Mm -hmm. And with the sort of laser I've got, that if you hold it in one place, it gets too hot. So there's yeah. a heat element. Whereas the low level, that doesn't happen. I, they, I as you know, they're yeah. using LED lights now instead of lasers. So it seems oh wow, I saw one just yesterday when I was doing some re uh, research on tinnitus. Um, I've forgotten the name of it, Lumamed or something like that. Uh, laser therapy that they're doing. Um, a doctor in Australia was doing it for the inner ear to regenerate the hairs on the inner ear um, to help, you know, tinnitus suffer sufferers and Meniere's yeah. disease sufferers. Yeah. Um, and they were getting lots of success with that. Um, yeah. And I certainly, you know, when I heard about it and did um, some, some research on it for mum, I think it's been a part of her recovery as, as well. I only had the intonas the nasal ones and the, I had mm. one at the 600, the, uh, 600 nm in the other one at the eight, uh, 850 but I'd like to look into this more yeah. there seems to be a lot going on around frequencies in general whether it's light frequencies or mm. PEMF um, pulsed electromagnetic field do you know anything about the PEMF at all yeah I mean I, I think this is a really exciting area it, it's to some extent, it started off with someone called Royal Rife in the in the States. Uh, do, you, do you know about him? No. He's a, he was a doctor um, back in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, um, who was really quite a brilliant doctor, but actually ended up um, in a sad situation because, well, I'll come to that. Um, so he started looking at how frequencies could be used in medicine. And... Um, what he found is that by using, he had a cathode ray tube in those days and to produce them. And he also developed at the time, the most powerful microscope, light microscope that existed, a very uh, intricate, complex microscope um, that allowed him to look at cells while they're alive, what's called dark field microscopy, which was very new at the time. Um, and what he could do is look at cells and then beam on 
with his cathode ray different frequencies and see what happened to them. Wow. And what he found is that he would change the frequencies and see different things. So he yeah. kept saying, you know, if you're trying to kill this bug, this seems to be the right frequency, or this cancer, this frequency seems to be the right frequency. Crikey. And did a raft of research over years um, and started getting some really quite astounding success with his patients. And a number of his close friends started, their colleagues started using similar instruments and again started doing very well until the FDA got wind of it all. And they came in and confiscated every part of his equipment that he had, and he was left in ruins. Um, oh. by it. Um, I have and yet that. Yeah. there's a huge amount of um, uh, information left behind about what he was doing. And so a lot of the ideas of different frequencies for different illnesses came from his early work. That's right. I um, do remember that story now. And there's, there's a few of his machines that have been... Absolutely. Uncovered. So there, there are some Couples. original ones possibly. When they say original, it's really hard to know because we don't know really what the original ones because there's some in, in some uh, sort of stronghold by the FDA. They yeah. Got rid of them. What's them. that about? But uh, <laughs> there are also some very modern versions of them now, uh, which are uh, computerized, which obviously he couldn't do. Um, but so just to say that, I think the electromagnetic field concept. Um, I mean, we're in, we're in a, a very low electromagnetic field when we're not around other gadgetry, uh, and we're inside the field of the Earth, which you know the Schumann frequency. Yes, and, yeah. Um, which are an important frequency that have been there since you know we evolved. So they're part of our evolution. So they're part of what is normal for us. Yep. And so those frequencies are quite important frequencies, as opposed uh, to the EMFs. That we, yeah, so when we start coming in with very set frequencies like 50 hertz for our electricity and all these other things, we're actually interfering with the whole uh, our normal um, ability to stay in home homeostasis to some extent. And this is where, uh, yeah, the EMF side of the argument or, you know, the, the problems that we're possibly facing with with the emissions from all our devices and 5G coming, goodness knows what that's going to do. Um, and yeah. PEMF is very different though it's using the totally. right frequencies so that and it's also using the therapeutic way and and by and large in in a at a low level rather than a high level you don't yes. necessarily again have to use massive magnetic fields to get the effect that you want you can use really very subtle ones and again um, it's working on the mitochondria I, I believe from the research that i've done it's actually having an effect on the mitochondrial health and function um and i i, I just I wish we had a, <laughs> I wish everybody could have access to a, a, a place where we had all of these things lined up next to each other and, you know, the ones that are lower risk at least that we could all, you know, be able to use without huge costs involved in, in a utopia, perhaps um, mm -hmm. something like that will I, happen I think, one I day. Think we're moving a, a little bit towards that. And, yeah. And um, I, I expect, and, and maybe on another occasion, I'll, I'll talk about sound therapy and how the, that's another component but, of frequency. But I, I agree, um, uh, you can use CES, which is cranial electric uh, stimulation. Yep. Um, uh, very simple devices like the Alpha Stim, very expensive for what it is, yep. um, that almost immediately induces a sleepy, relaxed state. Yes, yeah, I've been, I've been studying seconds. that one too. You see, yes. Um, and, <laughs> and it's kind of bizarre that you can just put two clips, a clip on each ear and uh, start the machine. And uh, within minutes, you're feeling drowsy and very relaxed. It's mentioned um, in um, Ben Greenfield. He's a famous uh, biohacker and trainer out of the States um, in his new book, Boundless, which is quite a, an amazing book. Um, it's got you know everything known to man in there. Um, he mentions the CES and using that to to go to sleep every night and how it's improved his mm -hmm. um, his sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there's just so much things that are coming, and I and I find it really exciting if we can integrate the traditional me medical model with some of these, like you are doing, um, mm -hmm. and that that's a really exciting thing for me. And I, I just wish we had more access for more people. As you said before, I don't need any promotion because I have so many people wanting to come to me and I can, I can truly believe that because there's such a need out there 
Um, there sure is. You know, for all I, of these things. I think things. the wonderful, uh, unfortunately, there, there are a few uh, old phrases in medicine. One is that medicine changes uh, according when the previous generation dies. It's, <laughs> it tends to move slowly. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a bit whereas, faster this time. <laughs> whereas people vote with their feet. And I think that's what we're seeing a lot of. People yep. are actually saying, I don't want this, I want that. Um, rather than just accepting what's there. And just and taking... I think that's very healthy on the whole. I do too saying, okay, I'm, I'm getting quite informed about what I think I need. I just need someone to guide me through that process and if necessary, provide me with some of the resources. And so I think that's a very important thing. Um, and I think by and large, it is being embraced a bit in general practice uh, to some extent, but probably less so as you move up the ladder into secondary and tertiary care, which is the kind of specialist areas. And this is why um, I think it's important that, you know, we're, you know, want to be in the preventative space where possible so that we, you know, are looking at things before it gets to the point where everything's taken out of your control because you're now in the intensive care or in, in the hospital at yeah. some, where it's actually impossible to get any of these things. Um, yeah. And it's uh, important that we take control and ownership. And this is what this show is really all about, is, is, is educating people about the things that are out there and the things that they can do their own research. It's, it's a curation, if you like, of information from brilliant minds in different areas so that we can have these, can have these conversations and open up these discussions so that we can start to realize that there is more than just a pharmaceutical model or a surgical model, which is mostly what we, we're, we're offered. I mean, those are very important and very good, but it's not they're the largely, only. Yeah, they're largely the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff to some extent. Exactly. They're, they have much more difficulty dealing with chronic long-term problems. Yep. They're good for the acute and, the, and you know, if I break my leg, I'm going straight to the hospital. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, excellent. And then you might come but, home and uh, do a hyperbaric session on the way home. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd immerse my, I'd live in it. <laughs> exactly. I would too if I had what, the one that you've got. That's brilliant. Um, yeah. Just coming back to um, hormone, um, sorry, I wanted to talk about hormones in relation to brain injury. Is this something um, uh, you're so, seeing... Oh, Yes. Yes, underdiagnosed so, often with traumatic yeah. brain injuries, especially. A very interesting point you bring up. In fact, I should. Um, I have a whole um, presentation on all of this, but um, one of the papers I'm just kind of going to it. So I can actually. I have to get you back on to to take us through the whole <laughs> presentation. <laughs> um, okay, so this is. I'm just reading from my slide now. The prevalence of hypopituitarism. So your pituitary mm -hmm. gland just uh, behind your eyes and produces several hormones. In mild, moderate and severe brain injury was estimated at 16.8% for mild. So that's nearly 17%. Mm -hmm. um, uh, interesting, only 10.9 for moderate and 35% for severe TBIs. But what that's saying is that people can have interference with um, some of their hormone production mm. from a relatively mild event. Because yeah. TBIs are common. We now realize one of the big things that's only recently kind of come to light is how frequent TBI, what we call MTBI, mild traumatic brain injury. And um, uh, from sports through to domestic violence through to all sorts of things where people are getting minor injuries all the time, when I yeah. say all the time, several in a row or within yeah. a period of time. And it can be that I had, saw a patient just this week, for instance, who had come up from Christchurch to see me, who had um, had an injury a year ago where he had walked into a, a metal bar because he was yes. looking the wrong way I, um, and wasn't actually too. knocked out. <laughs> But then when I started talking about it, he said, oh, well, yeah, and the previous year I did that, and then I fell over and hit my head, did that, and the year before that. And we had this whole series of minor traumatic brain injuries. And this was the straw on the camel's back, because exactly. since his last one, he's hardly been able to work. He can't concentrate. All these things that are familiar to us with MTBI. And so it's often that kind of background of quite a few, and then something knocks you out when well, i'm yep. saying knocks you out bad words but something yep. pushes you over the edge 
And then you start to have, well, actually, yeah, we, he, he's um, had some consults with me as well. And I, I've, um, it, it, I think people think uh, that they have to have been knocked out, had a major car accident before anything is actually a real problem. Or if they had it, um, so in the case of my brother, who he was a professional rugby player, um, some of the, the, the things that I'm seeing in him now, and I have permission to talk about his um, information, um, are signs to me of a delayed response to brain injury and you know, helping him work through all of those. But often you, you won't know that it was the thing that you did 10 years ago, perhaps, that can still be affecting your brain or that your personality has changed because of a brain injury or your energy levels, your hormones and so on. And this is why it's really important. And I'd, I'd also add in there that that straw on the camel's back of that minor injury may actually be because there are other things going on like other toxins, whether they're heavy metals or um, uh, Absolutely. chemicals related to what you work in, uh, and so forth. So there can be a variety of other things that were sitting there in the background and until really challenged, you didn't seem to have a problem with them. Yep. When you challenge, you do. And you then have to deal with those as well to come right. That's it's so brilliant. It is so, so brilliant. To, you have to go through a, a detox process quite often to deal with some of the oldest, well, some of the background stuff, I should say. Yeah. And so, you know, looking at like with brain injury and optimizing brain health, we need to be looking at foundational health uh, issues mm -hmm. as well as, okay, so the fancier things like the hyperbaric and the laser and all of those, the hormone assessments um, and, and starting to, to uh, educate people around, you know, systemic inflammation and uh, the job in mitochondria and all of these aspects, which heavy metal detoxing, which is something that we should all probably be interested in. Um, and then layering on top of that some of these other therapies. And that multi-pronged approach is, is something that I think um, has been the reason that I think I've been successful with mum, is that having those, those layers and then continuing to look what is the next thing, what is the next area that I can explore to bring the next bit back. Um, and, and as you say, it can build on each other. And as we get older, we build more toxicity in our body from yeah. metals most of us have got some we, sort of we a, have history <laughs> we, we do and we collect it and then it starts to it's that bucket isn't it we sort of mm -hmm. manage it to here and then it overflows and then it's all sorts coming out <laughs> so let's you know being in that preventative mindset of okay i'm going to help my body detox before i, I perhaps get something else happen to me um you know can be a, a good uh, a good way of looking at it um, oh man, we, we've covered a whole lot of <laughs> areas, haven't we, Doctor? Um, just one last question. Uh, for me, an area that I'm interested in, and I've just got uh, a new kit, new ozone therapy kit. What's your take on ozone? Um, this is something I've just been getting into the last couple of weeks and researching. Um, mm. And is it, you know, like it seems to have some of the same benefits as hyperbaric in, in a way, um, mm. a different process and delivery but um it seems to be quite similar in some aspects have you had any experience with ozone at all a bit um i'm not an expert on it so i'll say that mm -hmm. first up but i've read a fair amount on it and mm -hmm. i have a colleague working for my clinic now who has a hemoperfusion ozone equipment which is oh. the kind of top of german stuff it is oh um, good so, i'm uh, coming to see them <laughs> 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 so um, I think uh, ozone, like many things, is a double-edged sword. So people, first of all, must never breathe ozone. Yeah, yes, it's yeah, not clear. It's toxic to the lungs. So the idea that, oh, I'll just get a kit and breathe some is the completely wrong thing to do. No. So yes, it has to be introduced into the body, and that's where we run into problems, first of all, because you can put it in through um, various orifices yep. other than the breathing one. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, that makes it plain yeah. um, uh, or it can be given intravenously and um, it can be given intravenously in two ways uh, one literally as a bolus of ozone which is somewhat um, it could be risky um, and and although those that use it say that it isn't um, 
uh, or you can take some blood off, mix it with the ozone and reperfuse it, which is the one in Germany, it's been done for many years now. So there's quite a lot of research from them about its use. Um, and I think it, it has a definite role as a, as a strong antiseptic for a start. Mm. So in mm. terms of killing bugs within the organism, um, it, it probably has an anti-cancer component. The problem with when we say probably is actually getting the research done. So again, Same this problem. is more um, yep. uh, uh, anecdotal evidence, yeah. um, but it, it has a way of reoxygenizing, very similar, I think, to hyperbaric, but also sterilizing as well, which is slightly different from hyperbaric. So it's too... for hyperbaric, you, it has to be an anaerobic bug for that to work. Uh -huh. um, so I think it does have some definite roles. Um, I think if you're doing your own, you, you're talking, it, it's, just you've through, got to be very careful yeah, how you the home apply therapy. It. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, air insufflation so, and rectal insufflation, um, cupping, that type of thing. Um, but yes, yeah, I think I think it's a good thing to have a few obviously you need to be taught and I'm doing some training in it this week. Um, how to how to use it safely. Definitely don't want it anywhere near your lungs. Um, but it, it's a it, it, that 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 danger aside, as far as the lungs is concerned, a very good thing to have as a basic first aid for any infection that you get. You know, mm. speak Corona, even maybe they're looking into the research at the moment as if if it can help with um, uh, the coronavirus. And I've got a Dr. Rowan coming on my show next week, who's uh, one of the world's top experts in ozone therapy. So really excited. He actually went mm. to Africa in the Ebola crisis. Um, uh, got shut down, unfortunately, by, shall we say, the mafia somewhere over there when he was uh, treating patients and uh, treating and training the doctors in it. But it is a very, it seems to have a lot of research over a long period of time. And again, um, I think uh, a very interesting one to do more research on yourself and uh, to yep. maybe add into the to the to the list of uh, things that you can do. I definitely think so. And of course, you know, for me, I would be probably in, if I was concerned about, personally concerned about COVID, be using high dose intravenous vitamin C, which we do here anyway. So that's part of the same. Just had my um, dad at having that great. today. <laughs> <laughs> Down at um, my doctors. <laughs> um, but uh, you brought up an idea that one of the research the Germans had done in Africa on malaria was using um, one of the blue lasers intravenously so oh, yes. put through a tractor into the vein uh, while taking one of the B vitamins which um, so this is using PDT which is photodynamic therapy so um, photo meaning the laser dynamic meaning you give something which sensitizes whatever the target is to the laser in this case it's the bacterium or at least it's actually the malaria parasite, I should say. Wow. Um, and they showed very definite success with doing this. Wow. Um, just use light and a vitamin B. Is that um, the UV irradiation, I think they call that, is uh, it? That was, it's, yeah, there, there's UV radiation too. So this is, a, um, this is using PDT, which is similar, but using, for instance, one of the things that I've been working with is, is PDT here, where we use the infrared um, laser with a sensitizing agent, which is uh, called indocyanine green. It's a green dye that the um, eye specialists use to look at the back of your eye. Mm -hmm. um, and um, cancer cells take it up preferentially to normal cells and hold on to it, whereas normal, normal cells pass it through within 30 minutes wow. or so. So what you do is you give this an hour or two before your treatment and then shine the laser light at the cancer. And I've had one remarkable um, disappearance of a cancer just doing that. Um, wow. So um, again, I'm not that? saying it work for everybody before I get no, too many calls. No, no, we're not going to get, yes. Yeah. This is an area of uh, interest and it's called PDT, photodynamic. So using light with an agent that dyne, uh, and also I use an ultrasound, I've got an ultrasound machine. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that sensitizes you to ultrasound is curcumin. Oh, so you give good the person lots of curcumin, 
fabric um, and use the ultrasound. And because tumors hold on to it for a long time, you can use that too. <laughs> Goodness me, isn't that isn't that funny? That's um, so we now we now do what we call SPDT, sono photodynamic therapy. Right, I'm going to have to look up that one now, and I've learned something new to 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 to. to but I'm saying, this is experimental, so it's research stuff. So it's not something that's out there for everyone to go and get. Yeah, it's it's something that's been looked at around the world. There's a huge amount of research going on in in medical circles and science circles uh, to find exactly the right agents, the right um, frequencies, and so forth. But a promising uh, area. You, you know, using nanotechnology to deliver the sensitizer to the cancer as well. So there's a lot of very fancy stuff going on. Wow, this is very mm -hmm. exciting. Well, I think we've um, covered a lot of ground okay. today, haven't we? <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Tim. I really appreciate your time and the Thanks. fact that you, you know, we have such a great doctor in our midst and, and um, who is looking at all of these very exciting areas and, and integrating knowledge from all areas and having such an open approach to it i think that's absolutely brilliant um i wish you were a bit more local it would be good <laughs> i would um love to have you again on the show to talk about maybe do a presentation and the the uh the information that you were talking about there just earlier at some stage when you have time but um super appreciative of your time today i know that you're an extremely busy man um, is there anything that you would like to say to wrap up the, the show or any, any you know, final words? Um, I think just that I'd support the whole idea of, of integrative medicine as, and I think that can involve a whole load of different health practitioners working together to get that model, by the way, rather than just one person, um, as the way forward to the future for getting not just from disease to some degree of wellness, but getting to full well-being, the next layer up. Optimal. And I think that's really where we're heading in, in a lot of ways, uh, through lifestyle, you know, diet, all of these different things. And for me, like you've been talking about today, what excites me particularly is the idea of using light, color, sound, and vibration as part of that journey. I think it's fascinating. I think we're only part way there. Uh, we haven't mentioned sound yet. That's another whole area. So there's some interesting things going on to try and make that happen. Oh, very exciting times ahead. I can't wait for a little bit more research to happen and, and to make it more um, less expensive and more uh, doable for people so that they can actually get it. Dr. Tim, thank you so much for your time today. I thank really, you. really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and we hope to, hope to have you on again soon. <laughs>